Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, would you meet with us now in a powerful and profound way? Would you uh, cause the text to be clear, Christ to be beautiful, me to be faithful, and us to be changed? In your name and for your glory. And the church said, Amen. Amen. We turn our attention now to 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. A brief word on why I love expository preaching or expositional preaching or line by line, verse by verse preaching. The reason I love it is, I, well, there's a bunch of them. But one of the reasons I love it is because of exactly what is about to happen this morning. This morning, in the middle of an election year, or beginning an election year, right off of Super Tuesday and all of that, as we head toward a very, very contentious election, and as we pray about the process of potentially starting to do our tax returns, I'll probably sometime second week of April, um, in, in, in that moment, right now, the Lord has seen fit to give us the, 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 next, the next text. It's just always, as, the, as a preacher, you love this because it's just what's next. So as you preach through the Bible a verse at a time, you don't get to skip verses or pick, the, you, you just, what's next? And what's next is on this particular morning, in this particular country, in this particular moment in, in time, we are pressed into and forced into the good, the good teaching of the Lord's command that in light of the gospel, who we are as gospel people, that in light of who we are as gospel people, we are then invited to um, manifest various submission, uh, hearts of submission in different places. You'll notice verse 13, be subject or submit to. You'll notice again verse 18, servants be subject to, submit to. You'll see it again in, in chapter 3 and verse 1, wives be subject to, submit to. And it continues through. And so what Peter sees is he sees that we as gospel people, we as gospel people, remember chapter 1, we who have been loved beforehand by God the Father and purchased by the blood of His Son, we those people as sojourners and exiles are now called to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against our souls and to keep our conduct among unbelievers honorable so that when they speak against us as evildoers, they will see our good deeds and glorify God on the day that He returns. And so we are a gospel-believing people who then must manifest gospel living. And that is precisely where Peter goes. And he does not start in a place where I would have started. That's why it's good that I didn't write the book. He starts in a place of submission to governmental authorities. If your job as a preacher or your goal as a preacher is to make friends, you probably skip this one. And yet here we are. Yet here we are. Sermon in a sentence, some of you like it when I do the sermon in a sentence. Submit to government authority as you worship the king of glory. That's it right there. Submit to government authority as you worship the king of glory. And you better keep that order straight. You better keep that order straight. So we turn our attention to the text, verse 13. Be subject Submit to, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. What we're going to do is I'm going to work through the text. I often will preach this way as, as it pertains to being helpful. We'll work our way through the text, make sure we understand it. And then I'll have two words for us briefly uh, and we'll be done. So let's set about to understand at least verses 13 and 14 to begin with, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Be subject, the word underneath there is the idea of submission. The idea of submission has with it carrying the idea of respect or honor and also an action called obedience. Respect, honor, obedience. You'll notice, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. It's not just submit to the government because ultimately they're the government. No, submit to the government because uh, for the Lord's sake. 
for the Lord's sake, for the, king, for the sake of the king. Honor the emperor for the sake of the king. Honor the emperor because Christ is king. Honor the emperor, uh, submit to the government as obedience to King Jesus. Submit to the government as obedience to King Jesus. Jesus. Now it's interesting, and you notice if you look carefully, I don't know what translation you're working with, but be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. The, the word under human institution is actually the, the word creature, human creature, which is kind of interesting because why would you need to say that? Well, Peter says that, and of course context bears out what he means. He means the government, but he says creature because he wants to remind the first century church in Asia Minor whose emperor thought himself to be deity, that he in fact is not deity, and only Christ in, in Christ alone is, is um, God in the flesh, an actual deity, and everybody else is lesser than him. And so while this pervasive culture in which the first century church existed was to actually worship the emperor as deity, Peter says, no, 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 no. You only worship the king. You worship the king of glory. Christ and Christ alone, but as an evidence that you worship Christ and Christ alone, you also submit to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Now, there's some debate around the governors being sent by him. Who's the him? Is the him the emperor or is the him the Lord? I will tell you, I think that in Peter's mind, the way that this um, flows in, in, in its logical thought process, I think that he has in mind that these governors are sent by the emperor as supreme. But Peter would not argue one bit that ultimately it is God who is sovereign over both the emperor and the governors. So I'll show you that from Romans 13. If you can get there in time, great. Otherwise, I'm just going to read it to you. This is the Apostle Paul saying essentially the same thing in Romans 13 in verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Interesting. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Every human authority instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. So what Paul said and what Peter agrees with is, is that there are human authorities, authorities plural, but there is one authority over all human authority, and that is God and God alone. So, the, the emperor sends out governors to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good, but it is ultimately God sovereign over, over all of that. What Peter did here for the first century church is very similar to what he just did for us, and that is, he, we're not only talking about the president here, we're talking about state and local authorities instituted by God, placed by God over our lives. And we obey them as ultimate obedience to the King of glory. You'll notice that these governors are, are sent out to praise those who do good and to punish those who do evil. Perhaps the question is, is what happens when they get that wrong? Well, we'll talk about that. Maybe another question, what happens when I have a say in a constitutional republic of voting them in or voting them out? We'll talk about that too, just not right now. Verse 15. For, because, verse 15, because this is the will of God, this is the will of God, this is God's will, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. By doing good. What's it mean to do good? Well, it means a lot of things. But in context, it means doing good like, like um, participating in active, not passive, active obedience and respect and honor shown to local and state and federal authorities that God has placed over our lives. That we ought to be active in doing good. 
positively doing good. I'm reminded of those words from Jeremiah to, see, to, to, to exiles, to, to those who actually don't ultimately belong to the country in which their sandals are, are, are placed, to actually seek the good of their city. And so I think Peter here is echoing a similar idea. Go do good in the participation in, in the political system in which God has placed you. And do good in active, not just passive, but active ob- o- obedience to your governmental authorities. And do good... So that when ignorant and foolish people, I think in context they're unbelievers, um, would bring a charge of an accusation against you, that if the charge or accusation was to be run to the bottom, there would be nothing there. It doesn't mean they won't bring the accusation, it just means that when they don't, that when they do, nothing ultimately will be found at the bottom of it. Now it's interesting because of course, I think Peter anticipates and and runs an objection at verse 16. Live as people who are free. Now you got to remember, we are from verse, uh, from chapter one, we are the selected rejected. We are sojourners and exiles, aliens. We don't ultimately belong here. And we are people who are free. Now ask yourself the question, how did I become free? Well, you were ransomed, you were purchased, you were bought by the blood of Christ. You were a slave to sin, a slave to idolatry, to your political party, whatever the case may be. And you have been set free and purchased by the blood of Christ. Live as people who are free, but not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Let me tell you how that could possibly work. I think this is what Peter has in mind. You read through the first two and a half chapters of Peter's letter to, this, to these first century churches spread across Asia, Asia Minor, and you say, I'm an exile, which is true. I'm, I was loved by the Father before the foundations of the world were laid, also true. I've been set apart by His Spirit, true. I've been purchased by the blood of the second member of the Trinity, Jesus, true. This world is not ultimately my home. True. So therefore, what I can do is go dig a bunker somewhere, hide in a hole, and wait for the king to return. False. Because what Peter means to do is he means to have us see that yes, we are sojourners and exiles. Yes, we don't ultimately belong here. Yes, Christ is our king. But even as he is our king, and all of that remains true, we are supposed to be actively engaged in seeking the good by doing good and seeking the good of the place and the places in which God has sovereignly placed us. So don't use your, verse 16, don't use your exile status as an excuse to disobey the government authorities God has placed over you. Don't use your freedom as a, as, a, as, a, as a means by which you can then think that you are free to disobey governmental authorities. You're not. Or said another way, we submit not because we, ult- we submit, not because ultimately we are their servants, but because we are ultimately God's. The word depends on your translation. The word servant of God there, we living as servants of God because all could also be translated as slaves of God. You have been set free by Christ and are, and now you belong to God. And so the logic goes, obey your civil authorities, obey the authorities that God has placed over you, not Ultimately, because you are their servants, but ultimately because you are a servant of the King of glory. And so you have to see this because I'm afraid a bunch of us don't. Our horizontal obedience and respect to our governmental authorities is ultimately vertical in its orientation. We worship God, love God, have been purchased by God, wait for the day that God returns and makes all things right. And since that's true, we then obey the authorities that he has placed in our lives. This is how the logic of all biblical submission works. Whether that be the um, unpopular notion of submission to government. 
or the unpopular notion of a wife's, uh, of a wife's submission to her husband. Or um, the, 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 the submission of a, of a child to its parent. In all of that, it is vertical in its orientation on one level, but ultimately finds its greatest fulfillment and, and, and um, an angle in its Godward orientation. God has sovereignly placed these authorities in our lives. We therefore, out of obedience and worship to him, submit to and obey them. Now, does that mean that there, is nev- that, that there is never a time for a Christian to disobey the government? Well, of course it can't mean that. Because when the king of glory tells you to do something, and the government tells you to do something, and what the king of glory says is different than what the government says, who do you go with? The king of glory. Why? Because... The king of glory is eternal and will never pass away and one day will return and you will stand before him and and stand to account. So therefore, we we obey the king of glory when, um, and, and we obey the king of glory as we obey the government. But if the government ever says, go do this thing, in other words, if the government asks you to participate in the celebrating of evil and in the punishing of good, you say, I can't do that. And you can't do that because that is not what the king of glory has ultimately called you to do. Can I just tell you, you better get that sorted out right now. You better get that sorted out right now. I'm afraid that the reason so many of us fold up under cultural pressure and peer pressure and 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 certainly it appears as though one day governmental pressure is because we haven't thought it out ahead of time. Just think it out ahead of time and decide ahead of time what you're going to do and then pray and ask the Lord to give you the strength to do it. Peter continues with some rapid fire um, exhortations. Verse 17, first exhortation now in this rapid fire succession, honor everyone. Honor everyone. Now don't just skip that. Because you have no idea how countercultural that, that is. Honor everyone. This is what has made Christianity be so beautiful over the centuries, is that Christianity finds its desire to honor everyone in the fact that everyone, regardless of skin color, gender, whether you are in or out of your mother's womb, none of that matters. We honor everyone because everyone is an image bearer made in the image of God. And so we have said throughout the centuries, honor all of them. All of them. Number two, fear God. I love that. So you're going to, oh, I'm sorry. Did I jump ahead? I did. Feel free to shout me down next time I miss one. Honor everyone. One, two, love the brotherhood. Have a particular affection. We've already been here, but he's reminding us. Have a particular affection for the brotherhood, for the body of Christ, for the church. Now, why would you say that? Well, you might say that because it might just be that some within the family of God might have differing opinions on how to best go about living in and under the authority of the government. And perhaps in a two-party system, there might be some lines drawn between that later on. And Peter means to remind us that as you honor everyone, also love the brotherhood. Have a particular fondness and affection for one another that even in the midst of second and third tier disagreements of which you will have, love prevails over all. Number three, fear God. Now I'll just point out, you're supposed to honor everyone, and in a moment you're supposed to honor the emperor, but you better write it down. You give your fear, your awe, your reverence, your worship to one and one alone. Fear God. Awe, reverence, worship And then finally, honor the emperor. Now, obviously, somewhere in the Greek manuscripts, there is the hidden text that says only honor the emperor, or if you want, honor the only honor the president if you voted for him. Only honor the president if you like him. If you don't like him, just go around and say, that's not my president. I will say that what the previous president went through and what this current president has gone through as far as disrespect is absolutely almost unspeakable. 
And I don't care who you voted for or who you like. Honor the emperor. Show respect to the president. That's, it's got to be... If, if the church isn't doing it, then who will? If the church isn't doing it, then who will? And so this idea of not my president and all these other things and all these just horrible things that, that both of these presidents have, have, have um, gone through, I think is to be, is understandable from believers, but I'm sorry, from unbelievers. But for believers, we have clear and explicit commands. Ultimately, the last president was appointed by God. Ultimately, this president was appointed by God. And ultimately, the next president will be appointed by God. You better keep that in mind as you show him the honor and the respect that you should. Some presidents were appointed by God as a good and gracious gift to our country and others as judgment. He gets to pick, not you. He gets to pick, not you. Which brings me then to, I think, a right and fitting word of caution. A word of caution against the prevalence of political idolatry, not just in their day, but in ours. You'll recall, of course, that I reminded you of the fact that Peter is reminding his readers that the emperor is just a guy. He's just a guy. He may want you to think him to be deity, but he's just a man. He may want you to think him to be your savior. He's just a man. And I would contend that the prevalence of political idolatry is perhaps more on display in our day than it was in the first century. Certainly the president of the United States, the last one, this one, the next one, is not walking around and claiming to be deity, but there are many, God help us, even in the church, who treat him as though he is. Here's how you know if you are falling prey to political idolatry. One, you only see the moral failures of the other side. You will sit back from, on your, from your political side of the aisle and continually point out the moral failures of the other side, but never recognize the fact that yours is equally morally bankrupt. Idolatry. Number two, you will vote like your eternity depends on it. I just reminded some of you that it's an election year and, auto, and, and automatically anxiety rose up in you because you think that heaven and hell hang in the balance. Do you know that that is precisely what whoever the guy you vote for wants you to think? Every election, this is the most important election there ever was. Every single one of them. And every single time, Christians run off like their eternity depended on it and and, and go to vote. And that's idolatry. If your ultimate hope for a better world is whoever the next president is, number one, you will be sorely disappointed. And number two, what in the world do you think the king of glory who sits on the throne is going to come back to do other than make the world what it, is always, um, what it was always supposed to have been? And yet we kneel at the altars of our political guys and by their lies and worship them as if there is no king of glory When there is, number three, caution against political idolatry. If you have more in common with a political ally who is not a believer than one of your fellow sojourners who is a believer but differs with you politically. My brother is in some country, some place that's socialist. And there are, he's over there, not because he's a socialist, but because he is highly intelligent and gets hired by large companies to do things for them that they appreciate him doing, CFO or something of something. So anyway, he's in one of those countries over there. I think I have to go visit him later the summer out of duty, get on a plane for way too long, go land there. Almost everybody in that country is socialist, but there are people who follow Jesus there. Now, just so you understand, I'm not a socialist, but I do follow Jesus. When I get there, do I have more in common with my unsaved fiscally conservative neighbor who doesn't know Jesus on my dirt road or more in common with a socialist there who has bowed their knee to the king? Ask yourself the question. And there's a bunch of us who 
who we get around people in our same political, it doesn't even matter who their allegiance is ultimately to, we find all this commonality with them and we fail to realize we're going to be in eternity forever with the body of Christ, not your political affiliates. We're making some friends, I can just feel it. Number four, warning against political idolatry and its prevalence. If you're willing to disobey the king in order to align with your emperor, we got a problem. I don't need to say anything else on that. Number five. Number five, and I, I, I fear the most grave. Fifth caution against the prevalence of political idolatry. You spend all of your time proclaiming the excellencies of your guy and his party rather than the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into light. And the reason that matters so much is because your unbelieving neighbors, your unbelieving children, don't care near as much about your political guy as you do. And when they see you step in with more courage and passion to speak of the next president than they do the king of glory, and then we wonder why they're not impressed? That's idolatry, church. Idolatry. So a word of caution, which is what that was, and then an invitation to repent. What does it look like to repent of our political idolatry? I'm going to let you figure that out. That's the word of caution. And then in light of that, I need to bring, I think, a word of clarification. Because some of you could easily say, and I have friends who say this, and I respect them for it. I think they're wrong. But with the prevalence of political idolatry, and with the fact that we are in a two-party system where both of our candidates currently right now are absolutely morally bankrupt dumpster fires, what are we going to do? And, and you can easily conclude that what we should do, that what we should do is run off and hide, not participate, write in a third candidate. And I would understand why you would do that, but I would ask you not to. So somehow, without letting your ultimate allegiance be sacrificed on the altar of your political pundit, yet also then not running off and hiding in the woods and letting it play out, but rather seeking the good and actually using our voice to elect men and women who will have a biblical definition of good and a biblical definition of evil and seek to uphold good and punish evil, I don't think that retreat is an option. Rather, I think we must participate in the political process as exiles in light of the returning king. That's what we must do. And we must do that because the church must stand in the face of cultural evils because if she doesn't, then who will? And I will point out to you, Unfortunately, we are far more ignorant of our church history than we ought to be. I will point out to you that it has always been the church stepping into places where, cultural began, where, where the culture began to adopt what was evil and the church said, no, no, no to the way that the culture has treated women, no. No to the way that the culture would abandon newborn babies to the streets to let the elements take them, no. No to the European and African slave trade, both there and here. Messy though it may have been, but the church said no. No to Jim Crow in the, in the, in the South. No. Now in all of that, you would be gravely to mis mistaken to think that First Baptist of whoever and Second Presbyterian of wherever came riding in on white horses to, to, to bravely fight off all of the cultural evils. No, our history is a messy one, but it cannot be argued with. It was the church. And now it must be the church again. To stand against one of the greatest abominations, and it is not a new abomination, but to stand against one of the greatest abominations to ever walk across the pages of human history. They sacrificed babies to Molech in the day and God hated them for it. And we have continued to do the very same thing. 
I long for a day, by the way, when we can sit back in, in, in this broken, though it may be, but g- given to us by God, two-party political system and argue about who's better for the economy or whose foreign policy is better. But we do not have that luxury right now. While one side of our government celebrates the disfiguring of babies in the womb and the dismembering of those image bearers once they come out of the womb and the other just seems to have not done hardly a thing about it. What do you do in that moment? Well, I would contend you do three things. One, pray. Something like 65 million babies killed in their mother's womb Since the 60s, you pray. I should probably say that what I'm saying right now is only controversial if you don't take the Bible seriously. And and I just want to be clear, like some of you are like, I will never come back here. But listen to me, I'm just telling you, this is only controversial if you don't take the Bible seriously. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you recognize the fact that at the moment the Spirit put um, the King of Glory in his mother's womb, he was a human baby in his mother's womb. And if you understand that, then you understand that every other um, baby that it's in its mother's womb, when it is conceived, which is a miracle and a gift of God, is in fact a human baby. So to end that baby's life is murder. That's just clear in the Bible. They're an image bearer regardless of whether they're in the womb or out of the womb. It doesn't matter. Just like they're an image bearer whether they're black or white or a man or a woman to be consistent with the Bible, which is why Christians have always led the charge on these things. It's just not controversial. So number one, we pray. Number two, we participate in local and state and federal elections. And we do so with the ability to categorize the issues. And we do so in light of the king returning. And I will tell you that in all of these, you are always going to need to apply, as far as I'm aware of, situational ethics. Meaning, you will always have to choose the lesser of two evils. I wish there was a guy on the ballot or a woman on the ballot who is a Jesus-following, gospel-preaching, Bible-believing, baby-protecting guy. But there's not. Man or woman, but there's not. So any time that that's the situation, I think... And I understand and I respect my brothers and sisters who who decide to sort of just write in a third party or whatever. But I think in those moments we have to, as it were, recognize these are the choices and pick the one that is the lesser of the two evils. Third thing. I prayed about this a lot lately. Someone needs to do something about this adoption debacle. How is it that you can murder your baby like that and it's almost free or the government will subsidize it and yet it takes you a year and $40,000 to adopt a baby? How does that work? Somebody needs to do something about that. Somebody smarter than me needs to do something about that. Now, my prayer is that someday we'll just call a baby a baby, a human a human, regardless of where they are, color their skin, all of that, and we'll just call them that, and abortion will be no more. That's my prayer. But until then, what about an idea where... Where there are people, I just, somebody smarter than me needs to go do this, but, but where, where they're, uh, where, where we're offering, instead of killing your baby, adoption is a viable option. You have a bunch of, um, people in the church, Christians or, or not Christians, but who are, who are, ready to adopt and willing to adopt. And so within a certain geographical area, this woman has this unexpected pregnancy, doesn't know Jesus, none of that. And, and she's going to abort her baby and, and calls go out geographically within 10 miles. How many, how many Christians within 10 miles would go adopt that baby like that? It would happen. But the system is such, it's bankrupt and broken and someone needs to fix it. And I'm just going to pray that somebody fixes it and then somebody smarter than me needs to come along and figure out how to do it. Now, after having made those clarifications, I need to say this. The guy, the, the man or the woman that we wish was on the ballot wasn't, isn't, wasn't, probably won't be for a while. What do you do with that? I'll tell you what you need to do with it. You need to be willing to cry and pray and lament the current condition of our nation. 
you need to care about these issues and others. You need to participate. You need to do all these things. But you have to figure out, otherwise you're going to go crazy. You have to figure out how to get your eyes to the horizon. What is injustice meant to do other than make us long for the day that the just and righteous king returns and righteousness rolls like the river? You have to be able to, on, on the one hand, thank God for the country in which he has placed you and seek the good of it, while also longing for the day that the king comes back and fixes all that is broken, and one day he will. And that's why the church has been saying for 2,000 years, in the face of all sorts of injustice and difficulty, come quickly, Lord Jesus. So Father, you are the one who eternally holds the keys to death and hell. God, you know precisely when it is that you will give your son the nod and he will stand up from his throne and come for his bride. God, you know when that is and we don't. Would you cause hope to rise in our hearts and longing for that day? But until then, would we be about the good of our city, our county, our state, our nation? Would we be men and women who hold the Bible and the beauty and truth within the Bible tightly and participate in these things that you have sovereignly granted us the, the gift to participate in under the reality of the reverential awe that will fall over the entire universe when the king cracks the sky and comes home? to get us. God, would you give us wisdom as we step into these great evils of our day? Would we be men and women who preach the gospel, proclaim the excellencies of, of him who called us out of darkness and into light, recognizing that the only hope for this nation and any other nation and any people anywhere is the, is the preaching of the gospel and the in the gift of faith that comes by hearing and hearing through that preached word. And God, would you drive within us hearts, desires to be salt and light that slow the decay and beat back the darkness until the king comes and finishes it. We pray these things in his name and for his glory. And the church said, Amen. Amen.